Well, I don't feel I should have got the applause. But um, thank you so much for coming out. My name is Sally Lloyd-Jones, and I have the huge, supreme honor of introducing Marilyn Robinson. And I'm going to have to read it because she's done so much, I couldn't possibly rem remember all of it. So Marilyn is the author of four works of fiction and countless nonfiction essays. She's the recipient of a 2012 National Humanities Medal awarded by President Barack Obama for her grace and intelligence in writing. In 2016, she was awarded the Library of Congress Lifetime Achievement Award in American Fiction, as well as the Dayton Peace Prize's Richard C. Holbrook Distinguished Achievement Award. She's won the Pulitzer Prize, the Orange Prize, and the Hemingway Foundation Penn Award, among other honors. Critics regularly refer to Robinson as one of America's finest novelists and most formidable intellects. The New York Review of Books has said of her work, Robinson is really not like any other writer. She really isn't. She has created a small, rich, and fearless body of work in which religion exists unashamedly, as does doubt unashamedly. Another put it this way, Robinson's genius is for making indistinguishable the highest ends of faith and fiction, while another said of her fiction that she tracks the movements of grace as if it were a wild animal. For me, I love Marilyn Robinson's work. I'm a big fan girl. I'm trying not to be one. <laughs> The first book of Marilyn's I ever read was Gilead. It remains one of my most favorite books ever. Words I'd use, except of course others have used them before me, heartbreaking, poignant, lyrical, incandescent. One reviewer called Gilead a novel as big as a nation, as quiet as thought, and moving as prayer. The voice drew me in from the very first page. The gracious prose, I love every word, the sentences, all of it. There are revelations on the page that ambush you with beauty. This is what it feels like to believe. A faith is lived out. The sacredness of existing. The power of blessing. The mystery of redemption. The ordinary suffused with the divine. And it seemed to me at times that Ames, the 77-year-old pastor who is writing an account of his life to leave to his young son after he dies, reaches his fatherly hand out from the page and blesses me too, with wisdom, wonder, grace. Each time I read it, I'm so profoundly moved, I want to weep. And each time I finish it, I want to start it again because I miss it. Being inside these stories, I have, in the words of Ames, that same feeling in the church, that I am dreaming what is true. Without further ado, please help me welcome Marilyn Robinson. Hello, it's lovely to be here, wonderful to be here. I want to thank everyone who has brought me here and shown me such a lovely welcome. Um, I, I myself, you know, I'm a lapsed Presbyterian. <laughs> In any case, um, <clears throat> I'm going to read a little bit from um, a lecture that I gave in Lund in Sweden. Uh, for the theology school there. Um, and it's about how I wish we would do and hope we will do theology now. Um, so I will read briefly, then we'll have a nice conversation, David and I. Huh? Moses tells us, Jesus tells us, that we are to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Theology should give us some beginning of an idea of what it might mean to satisfy this commandment. 
A first step, I propose, would be a step back from all other disciplines and categories to invite a kind of awe at the entire phenomenon of being that embraces the disciplines and categories and error and aspirations and everything they touch, that embraces thought and error and the work the mind does in its sleep. Jesus, again quoting Moses, says, another commandment is like this one, that we love our neighbor as ourselves. Our neighbor, like ourselves, is objectively considered a creature born out of the tremendous, potent workings of the cosmos since, as they say, time began. We are also to love our enemies, which would surely mean taking on that most difficult and humbling realization that what they intend for evil, God in the course of historic time, might well intend for good. We who live now have an overwhelming wealth of knowledge, for want of a better word, since we seem to have a great deal of difficulty absorbing the knowledge we amass. We actually have some capacity to describe the emergence of being and to read in very distant light some part of its vast pre-human life. We have some insight into the brilliance of the trillion lives within our lives, the microbes and molecules that create us and sustain us. Brilliant voices wait in our books to speak in our minds if we let them. There is a synthesis that is unique to theology, an acknowledgement that, as sac uh, in sacred matters, in this theater of God's glory, we share with those strangers, our neighbors, that love means awe and awe means love. A the theology for our time would recover its old magisterial stale, scale and confidence. It would address anything and any relationship among things and give the world a simple, inclusive language far more adequate to what we know, less restricted in what we acknowledge than any we have at present. For a long time we have treated systems and ideologies as if their terms were at last sufficient to reality, as if in excluding all heterogeneous assumptions of religion particularly, they offered a truer representation of the world. These systems and ideologies, however we might embroider them, are in effect simple and simplifying. The invisible hand, the survival of the fittest, the dictatorship of the proletariat, superego, ego, and id. They are the antibiotics of the intellect, killing off a various ecology of reflection and experience in order to eliminate one or two troublesome ideas. What will replace that ecology is an open question, of course, and how potent, even to the point of pathology, the strains will be that survive the purge. My metaphor seems alarmist. I know that before we devoted ourselves to Darwin and Mar Darwinism and Marxism and Freudianism and capitalism, it was theology that was meant to inhibit thought and that these uh, successor monisms modeled their claims on that old claim of religious orthodoxy. We human beings never can make a truly fresh start. Nevertheless, a theology that would embrace rather than, than exclude would be a departure not only from its own troublesome history, but from the narrowness and, ad and aridity of the secular thinking that has displaced it. Theology has always employed language of a kind now isolated in the precincts of religion, the beauty of holiness, grace and peace, phrases that evoke a particular experience, a synthesis um, of thought and aesthetic response. From the point of view of obje objectivity, as presently understood, beauty and holiness are excluded terms and graces as well. The accepted means of establishing what is real cannot acknowledge them. Yet the celebration of holiness in every form of art has shaped civilizations. Granting human proneness to error, it is naive to imagine that it afflicts religion or anything else uniquely. 
It is the genius of science to have built this predisposition into its method. But this has not made science proof against the greater error involved in supposing that it is in fact the arbiter of reality. Christian theology, uniquely among the forms of Western thought, need not proceed by exclusion. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Christ was in the beginning with God, and without him nothing was made that was made. The categorical blessing put on all that exists raises the problem of evil, certainly, but more importantly, it asserts a very broad, unconditional reality, a givenness that in its fullness reflects divine intent. It is the tendency of all the systems and schools I have named to raise questions about the origins and even the reality of human selfhood. Specifically, they challenge the moral self, that old wanderer through the trials and temptations of early life, earthly life. Considering how they differ in their premises, it is striking how consistently they exclude personal agency, how deterministic they are. Yet we all experience the reality of moral choice continuously. A theology for our time would acknowledge this reality along with the entire complex of suggest subjective experience, love, generosity, regret, and all their interactions without a diminishing translation into veiled self-interest. It could create a conceptual space large enough to accommodate human dignity. I have read too much history to have any impulse to idealize the past. Great pity and very great respect are owed to all those generations who lived and died before us, not least because they, through war and plague and famine, conferred a precious heritage on us of art, language, music, and thought. And they conferred as well a tremendous burden of festering hostilities vicious inequalities and outright crimes that we have had no success in understanding or ameliorating, that we have in fact compounded. Those of us who by accident or birth live long and enjoy relative peace and well-being know well enough that humankind beyond our borders still struggles under its ancient burdens with their modern variants. How to make moral sense of this is a question that has been pondered earnestly for generations, yielding few unequivocal results. Modern hospitals quickly become pest houses in the absence of an infrastructure many countries find difficult to sustain. The traditional agriculture becomes a pool of cheap labor, exploited until cheaper labor is found elsewhere, and then abandoned to the effects of social and cultural disruption. Ragtag armies have ferocious weapons. The fluidity of modern societies and the chaos of failed states expedite human trafficking. The list is long and we are implicated in it all in ways both obvious and subtle. I offer this very dark view of the world only in order to pose the inevitable question, what is to be done? But also to respond to this question in terms that are now more or less precluded by the practical urgency of these problems. The response I propose is that we preserve as we can the heritage we have received and that we enlarge and enrich it for the sake of coming generations. For a long time, I assumed that this was simply a thing civilizations did, a practical definition of the word civilization. Now I see that wealthy countries are stepping away from ancient com commitments to humanist education, first of all. Humanists are the curators in their own persons of art, language, music, and thought. The argument everywhere now is that the purpose of education should be the training of workers for the future economy. So the variety of learning offered should be curtailed and the richness of any student's education should be depleted to produce globally a Benthamite uniformity of aspiration and competence and a subservience um, to uses not of his or her choosing. Max Weber's iron cage is slamming shut. Why this should be happening now where it need not happen in countries that could be called by global standards plenty rich enough, 
why it is considered prudent to alienate, starve, even amputate institutions that are riches in themselves and creators of wealth of every kind, I do not know. But the impulses at work all over the West, inducing us to sell our birthright in exchange for a reward far less certain and sustaining than that famous pot of lentils. In the West, it was theology and its consequences that build these great institutions, and the ebbing away of theology that has made them seem to many to be anomalies, anachronisms, and burdens as well. They were addressed to the many mysteries of human life on earth and to the knowledge of God. Their mission would seem to have been the very height of impracticality if it were not so intrinsic a part of the emergence of the modern world. Theology and religion are not synonyms. Either can exist with, without the other, and either is diminished in the absence of the other. I can speak only of Christianity, of course. It would be a great presumption on my part to seem to generalize farther, at least, than to say that the highest intellectual and aesthetic achievements of every culture I know of seems to be associated with and addressed to their highest disciplines of religion, to their theology. The intentions that have created these institutions <laughs> have made them stewards of defining cultural values, of conceptions of truth and definitions by example of beauty. At this point, I should clarify my terms. By religion, I mean the individual and communal embrace of the particulars of a faith or loyalty or affinity to it that might not involve thoroughgoing belief in every article of its creed that might be or seem almost exclusively aesthetic, ethical, or social, but is in any case important to one's self-definition. Religion has a public character that can distract even the pious from its origins in the human intuition that reality is rooted in a profounder matrix of being than sense and experience make known to us in the ordinary course of things. By theology, I mean the attempt to realize in some degree the vastness and the atmospheres of this matrix of being. Theology is the great architecture of thought and wonder that makes religious experience a house of many mansions, open to the soul's explorations, indeed, made to invite and to accommodate them. One thing theology must do now is to re reconsider and reject the kind of thinking that tends to devalue humankind, which is an influential tendency in modern culture, one that, not coincidentally, runs parallel to the decline of religion. This devaluing of the species, in effect, puts aside everything interesting about us as irrelevant to the question of our true nature. Objectively speaking, this is a remarkable project, itself a datum to be factored into a consideration of the many ways we are strange. A new theology should be open to recognizing our anomalous character, not least for the light it sheds on the precious and amazing lawfulness of the world, ourselves excluded accepted. There is a sentence from a translation of an old English dream poem called Pearl that is especially pleasing to me. It says, my soul by grace of God has fared adventuring where marvels be. The speaker of the poem is describing a dream encounter with a lost infant daughter as a young woman in paradise. For me, the phrase has a more general application to life on earth. The sheer plenitude of things a mortal encounters is a marvel in itself. There is not only religion, never able to escape doubt, its shadow, there is also famed religion as well, and religion that has slipped into utter derangement. There is not only lofty and glorious theology, but theology as grinding labor, engrossed in its own difficulty. No other species than ours could be called earnest. This is our response to special difficulties that attend our singular, our singular nature. We are unique in the effort we spend on the problem of defining our purposes and then accomplishing them as the materials we put to work, facts, thought, words, slip and change while we work. 
No other species could be called ambitious, determined to reshape the world beyond the modest sufficiency that satisfies the niche-finding and nest-building generality of creatures. Error could be thought of as ex uh, error could be thought of as an extravagance. Parsimonious nature denies to mi migratory butterflies, but lavishes us on us unstintingly. Out of this indeterminacy, this great latitude, and within it, we can we construct our minds and our civilizations. These are things to be marvelled at, certainly. I think that's enough. Thank you, Marilyn, for being here with us this evening. Great pleasure. Very great pleasure. Um, I, I was very tempted to just uh, have a, a nice, quiet evening with you and be able to ask all these questions without uh, all these people listening in. Uh, but I very much wanted to use this time to kind of get behind a lot of the writings because I think a lot of people here have uh, your, your celebrity. And, um, and let me just read you what the New York Times wrote of you yesterday. Uh, and... Marilyn's book just came out yesterday, uh, What Are We Doing Here? Um, and it was promptly reviewed by the Times, and this is what um, the, uh, the reviewer said. To call these essays demanding does not do them justice. Robinson's great hero, the Puritan preacher and philosopher Jonathan Edwards, said we should never permit a thought that we wouldn't indulge on our deathbeds. With few exceptions, this collection meets that insane standard. <laughs> it's high-minded to the hilt and rigorous too. I was wheezing at the end of every chapter. <laughs> I was also moved, exasperated, put to sleep more than once and undone by it. It's a dense, eccentric book of profound and generous gifts. And that's a remarkable review to receive, and I, I almost felt it was also unfair in the sense that when you speak of Jonathan Edwards, people write something like that. But when everyone else seems to speak of Edwards, you know, they're almost derided and it's seen in a very <laughs> negative light. And as a Presbyterian myself, it's a little bit unfair. Anytime you speak of Edwards, you get these glowing reviews, but anytime um, anyone else seems to speak of Edwards, it creates a different kind of reaction. And, and I want to understand, you know, what do you see about Calvin and Edwards in this tradition that in many respects a lot of us get wrong, meaning the way that it's often received uh, to the larger culture instead of uh, seeing in a, in a narrow-minded, constrictive fashion, you seem to be able to bring out a different side of them. And so I'd just love to hear from you. What do you see about uh, these particular theologians? Well, you know, I think that they're frankly so consistently misread that, uh, I mean, of course I think I'm the person who interprets them correctly, right? That's, <laughs> <laughs> we live by these beliefs, but um, <laughs> nevertheless, I, you know, I'm an English scholar and so on. I, I feel that I'm justified in saying that they are actually uh, quite different writers and quite different thinkers than, than the way that they're usually interpreted. Um, ideas of their being stern or narrow or whatever uh, cling to them, you know, very inappropriately. Um, they, you know, Jonathan Edwards has to be read first of all as a great aesthetician, you know, and his, the touchstone for the beautiful for him is the highest possible experience of God. The idea of the, of the sacred and the beautiful are incredibly simultaneous for him. He pursues you know, the effort to articulate this uh, synth synthesis, in effect, very characteristically, um, and of course applies that standard to religious thought and religious practice, which is a very refining uh, standard by which such things should be judged. Um, if, if one assumes, as, as Edwards always does, that the signature of God in creation is, is the beautiful, you know, then you become alert to that, and perhaps you become capable of it, you know. Um, I think that one of the things that really plagues contemporary religious culture, one of many things, is that the idea of it as, you know, the idea of the beautiful gesture, in effect, as something that draws you nearer to a knowledge of God, the beautiful gesture always being generous, 
you know. Um, that, you know, I think that that's the most important ethical insight that people in, in the tradition of Calvin and Edwards had. For me, it's, it's very power, powerful, you know. Um, and I think that that's really dropped out of the interpretation of both of them. It's almost as if the idea of beauty were something ornamental, you know, when in fact it's intrinsic for them because the beauty is of the essence of everything that God creates, you know, um, everything God wills. Um, <clears throat> so, in, and you know, this comes out of the fact, of course, that well, it, uh, who knows what, but in the Calvinist tradition, it has to be remembered that Calvin was a classic humanist. You know, his first, his first published work was on Seneca, you know, on De Clementia of Seneca. Um, he, was, he was educated in the way that people were when they were going to be humanist scholars as opposed to theologians. He was never ordained or anything like that. Um, he read through Cicero every year whence his impeccable Latin, I suppose. But in any case, um, the, it's that, it's the, the Renaissance humanist conception of the beauty that is, people are capable of and that is intrinsic in human being and that is the, the, the given of the phenomenon of human consciousness. You know, that is central to them, not this business about, you know, whether you, how you dress or what you, you know, any of these other things uh, that they tended to be not terribly interested in being among the great geniuses of the Western world. Um, but, you know, I mean, if you just, uh, I, well, I, I think I've said everything. Ask me another question. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, no, I think what you're talking about in terms of the way that Edwards really embodies both truth and beauty. I think when I hear the, an essay that you just read for us, uh, the distinctive I hear in your voice, uh, oftentimes we approach theology from that truth side, from almost the scientific, uh, of finding uh, the normative truth claims of scripture and then creating a system of, of, uh, of knowledge and a worldview from that. But what I hear from you is the ability not only to see that, but also embedded in that is this, uh, this given of beauty uh, that is part of who God is. And, um, and I love the way that you capture that in the articulation of theology, that theology is something magisterial. It is something that should inspire as well as inform. Um, and as you've studied, uh, particularly the Puritans, do you see that that would you say that that was also embedded as a presumption in the way that they articulated their theology? Is this unique to Edwards, or is this kind of found in the precursors uh, of Edwards? Um, well, you know, I, uh, it's not unique in Edwards. It's in Calvin also, at a minimum. But I, I do think that it was a tradition of religious thought that... Uh, that's, that leapt over what are normally considered truths questions, I mean, as in doctrinal questions, and actually proposed a test, you know, I mean, um, the, Calvin talks, of course, about we live as, he says, we live as uh, actors on a stage, and, and God is appraising our performance, in effect, which I think is a very French sort of approach, but the, <laughs> but um, I think that what he's telling you is that if you are generous, I mean truly generous, if you are truly respectful of another person, if you truly respect the unbelievable fact of your own existence, which is highly unlikely by any statistical measure you want to apply, um, that in the fact of doing well you do beautifully, that these are simultaneous. Um, Calvin, the thing that I love about him particularly, he has a, a an ethic that I don't see articulated by other people, although I recognize it as very deeply Christian. He takes it to be true that, that all people are images of God. That's a very, very central assertion for him. And then he says, and you are here in this vision where everyone you encounter is God, you know? And whenever God encounters you, the question is, what is the question, you know? What, 
what do I do in this encounter that would be what God would consider a beautiful act? And, and so if someone is threatening to you or hostile to you, he says this very specifically because uh, people were threatening and hostile to him, so he knew wherever he spoke. But the, the, uh, if someone approaches you in the most threatening manner, in the most negative manner, and you assume that this is a situation that God has placed you in for your benefit, so that you have the opportunity of acting as God would wish in that moment, you know? Um, it's, uh, it, it, this way of thinking about the world ethically, it makes you a sort of participant in a continuous mystical experience, in effect, a continuous ex experience of the sacred. At the same time that it's not passive, it is something that is asking you, a humane gesture from you, you know? The asking the courtesy that you would give to Christ or that you would give to God, which of course is, you know, it's like in the parable of the last judgment, you know, insofar as you did it to the least of these and so on. That's, I suppose, probably his primary text for that. But in any case, um, I mean, I, I joke about how French he is, and he certainly is, but one of the things that I think the, the idea of the gracious act, the idea of the beautiful act, if it is truly generous, and, and of being caught up in the, the aesthetic experience of a truly generous act, or, or an act of true respect. He has a, he says, you know, he glosses the Ten Commandments, and he does it very interestingly, but one of the things he says that I think is very true, when on the subject of thou shalt not steal, he says if you deny anyone respect that is due to them, you've stolen from them. And this is simultaneous with the, his understanding of every human being as God, or sometimes Christ, you know, um, which means that it's really unlimited respect is owed to them, you know? It's a very, very high standard, a very beautiful, very uh, humane ethical standard. Um, I think that a lot of people found it unbelievably powerful and a lot of people found it too exacting, not hard to understand. Nevertheless, it is a beautiful conception and I think if, even if it's wrong, in the fact of being wrong, it would take you closer to what is right than almost anything you could do. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I very much appreciate, I think, the healthy corrective that you're, you're giving to Calvin and to Edwards and kind of fleshing out the fuller vision of who they are and what they espouse theologically. And, but what do you do with some of the harder things that they're both also associated with in terms of the wrath of God, in terms of predestination, these things from, uh, you know, for a lot of those who, who have not grown up in the church or exposed to theology, just seems a bit like, you know, unbelievable. Well, you know, when you look at how these things emerge historically, um, Calvin certainly didn't invent anything when he talked about the wrath of God, you know. <laughs> um, I mean, in, in general, that is, is simply true. If you think of, of uh, one thing or another being determinist, and you look at what else was being talked about, or what is talked about now, and it's determinist also, you know. I would say, you know, if you... The, the issue of predestination comes up a lot, talking about these people. And in the first place, Ignatius of Loyola believed in predestination. It's not as if that were anything that was isolated in that sect. He said, don't talk about it, but he said it was real. <laughs> <laughs> and the, but, but from the point of view of, of reformers like John Huss and, and uh, Martin Luther and so on, and Calvin himself, the idea is that you actually uh, live in relationship to God's will, that you, there is no mediating force that intrudes between you and God. For example, you can't earn merit, that, which was of course a big issue for them, that would guarantee a better outcome. You know? um, there is no bargaining with God. He never, you, he never owes you anything. You know? Um, and the, re the reason that they were so insistent on that is that they were taking people away from the sort of soteriology of Catholicism that made individual people dependent on a church. Um, 
so if, when you read the arguments on both sides, you can see maybe it could have taken another tack. But in terms of which is the less desirable, which is the more uh, domineering in a certain sense, I don't think you can easily choose one or the other. Yeah, uh, you wrote with respect to this kind of this theology of predestination. Uh, it is one of the greatest mysteries of the human spirit that a faith founded on the assumption that man's fate depends not on his own free will and acts, but was predestined from the beginning, should have moved its devotees not to supine inaction, but to deeds of heroism and self-sacrifice as vain as they were exalted unless they were a peculiar grace elect among the rest. And I think what I love about um, a quote like this is you place into context a lot of sound bites that people often have that distorts kind of the, the larger uh, profundity of these truths that actually begins to take away uh, the stereotypes that somehow uh, belief in predestination actually leads to inaction in our world where I think you've re recovered this vision that people like Edwards and the Puritans have been uh, powerful agents of social action in our world and uh, in many ways uh, account for the way that America developed and its uh, social welfare system and, um, and, and I think how, how do you how do you help us understand the importance of understanding the, not only the context, but the original sources? I mean, that's, I think, what people really admire. Why you speak so authoritatively is not the force of your character as much as it, it is just the fact that you have read these sources uh, yourself, and you can testify that these are not things you're making up, but these are things that were both in that time period as well as things that they've said. All right. Um, I, you know, they were, they were very great Calvinists of, you know, French people. The, the wars that were carried out, the religious wars that were carried out to exterminate the French Protestants, unbelievable, you know, just uh, extermination campaigns, you know. Um, and and um, many people, even many French noblemen, were profoundly heroic and self-sacrificial in the, in the context of these wars. And um, it's, you know, p people said of them that Calvinists fear God and nothing else, you know? And they were like that, you know, they're sort of like, I am in the hands of God, he will do justice to me, whatever that means. But I, I will not be false to him. I will not say what I do not believe, you know, I will not live in a way I do not consider righteous. Um, and it was, you know, I don't think there's a stronger revolutionary force in history than Calvinism actually has been. Even, you know, you can look at Marxism by comparison, I suppose. But, you know, the, the uh, in England, in France, in the United States of America, Calvinist populations are very strongly associated with anti-authoritarian resistance. And, uh, and, and you know, it's, it's not the easiest thing in the world to articulate, but the acceptance of fate, or the givenness of things, you know, the, the acceptance of divine will in the, every form is a tribute to, to the wisdom of God, you know? which was absolutely intrinsic to what they have believed. Uh, it gave them a great deal of courage. It gave them a great deal of calm. They wrote beautiful books. <laughs> and um, how did you come to know Calvin? Well, it was a strange thing. I, frankly, I was teaching a graduate seminar. Um, I arrived late at this, even though I know in retrospect that my Grandfather was a pretty representative of the, you know, good representative of the type. But in any case, um, I was teaching Moby Dick, and I thought, this is saturated with theology. And then click, you know, that, why didn't I ever think of that before, you know? The, the theology would, of course, have been Calvin. And so I did a seminar kind of to the astonishment of my graduate students where I was actually teaching the institutes and Moby Dick side by side. 
<laughs> I feel as though uh, even, you know, one of the things that's characteristic of Calvinist writers and thinkers is that they are always pushing the margins. They're always testing what they take to be asserted doctrines of whatever kind, you know, which is what Calvin does all the time, Emily Dickinson does all the time, and so on. Um, but when you, when you read them side by side, you begin to see what it is that what idea is being tested. You begin to see the kind of Calvinist method of, of idea testing within, the, within early American literature, you know? Um, so Calvin taught me Melville, and Melville taught me Calvin. So what you say as you were developing your, I mean, when anyone reads your books, it's clear that faith and theology is a significant part, and those things are so beautifully uh, wedded together. Did you come to your faith through the church, or would you just say oh, it's your own kind of exploration? I really have no idea. I really don't. I, I think I was very fortunate to grow up in a very spectacular landscape, you know, in the mountains, you know, where nobody else was, more or less. Um, and uh, I think that, you know, when you, I think I'm not the first to say that a kind of immediate association with nature, especially in circumstances where it's so clear that nature has the upper hand and the majority is on the side of nature and so on. Um, but I, I don't re when I found out about religion, when it began to, you know, occur to me what it was that people talked about, it seemed, always seemed true to me. And uh, I never had any reason to, I feel as though I simply had certain ideas or thoughts that occurred to me when I was very young and then I've just spent my life sort of exploring them, refining them, I hope, you know. But, um, as you, I know you're a part of your, uh, active part of your church, and w w where is the place then for um, the local body of Christ? The, you know, this idea of a covenant community coming together, especially in our age today. Mm -hmm. I think that if people gave a better sort of name to covenant communities, they would come together a lot more than they do. <laughs> fair, That's very fair. <laughs> One of the experiences that I have, that I mean, my life is very singular in many ways, but you know, fairly often I, I'm in Europe and I talk to journalists who are just journalists and they're always fascinated by religion. La Calvinista, they call me in Spain. And, <laughs> and um, they are not, I mean, this thing about, faith having evaporated and left Europe behind and all that. It's just not true. Uh, people may feel that that's a sort of necessary protective posture that they have to strike in certain kinds of circumstances. But when you talk to them directly and, and privately, you know, you find out that they're wistful about the loss of religious culture in Europe. They are far from having some sort of, you know, late enlightenment post everything you know, malaise, you know? Um, and I think that one of the things that is, is visible in that is that as it has always been, so it is now, people in very many cases have a, a natural religious intuition or instinct. And we, we discourage the expression of that. And our churches, I don't think, are much better at encouraging the expression than, you know, than the civic life in general. Um, but I think, in a way, we sort of, we insult people and we exclude them from kinds of thinking that they would like to be able to do by acting as if we encounter this sort of hostile secularism all the time. It's just not there. It's not true. Let me, <laughs> I mean, the, the world that you describe, I think, is very foreign to many of us. Uh, <laughs> where we do feel this real tension of uh, if we come out as a Christian, it's almost the, the sense of, um, for some you know, industries, you know, there's already such baggage associated with that. Um, and to be able to have, be formed spiritually so that, you know, despite the baggage that perhaps the culture brings to us, we have the sense of confidence that 
uh, what we present is something that's genuinely good for the culture and good for the world. Um, I think that's what we yearn for, and a big part of it I'm trying to understand is how were you spiritually formed like this, to be able to, to see the beauty of the gospel, to see the beauty uh, how, of how that gospel radiates in literature, radiates in nature, radiates in, in people. Uh, what was the spiritual formation as you look back on your life that was taking place? Well, you know, I, I did not grow up in, a, in an observant sort of family, you know. Um, what can I say? Calvinism allows me to say that it was my destiny to find <laughs> <laughs> But my, 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 one, my one unbroken rule in life is that I have hedonistically gorged myself on everything that I am fascinated by. And, and many of these things seem to other people to be, you know, rigorous and, and, and so on. <laughs> but, but the farther you get into them, it's like developing, you know, it's like developing a dialect in effect so that you overcome the sort of initial resistance that you might encounter reading older writers and so on, you know, or, or dealing with old thoughts that, you know, that need context before you know what, what is being said. Um, but that's just simply, I mean, I have always read what I could understand of theology and science also. Um, they, to me, they are, you know, they merge incredibly beautifully as conceptual systems. Um, but I don't, have a to I don't have a story to tell. Read good books. <laughs> Um, I think that, yeah, that actually put, heartens a lot of us here. Um, let me turn a little bit to your work in Iowa, because I, I, there's this great phrase that um, you say to your students, or, you know, write from your deeper mind. Um, what does that mean, write from your deeper mind? They know. <laughs> <laughs> Can you let us in on that secret then? Uh, <laughs> Well, you know, I think that it's part of an experience that anybody that practices in art or mathematics or any number of things uh, can, can have. You know, you find out that, for example, you ask yourself a problem, and I, I may pose a problem to yourself. Uh, mathematicians will say this. They present themselves with a problem. They can't solve it. They think they've forgotten it. And then they're sitting at a stoplight someday and the answer comes, you know. Um, there's one, we, your mind is vastly more than you imagine that it is. And I think one of the things that is a, that's thrilling about doing anything demanding, an art or a science or whatever, is that you find out how uncannily vast the resources of your mind actually are. And anybody that's writing well is drawing on this deeper sense of things. If you, when I was, um, I was living in France for a year once teaching there, and I was in a house in the countryside, and the little kids in the, in the voisinage, you know, had, they were not tired of Americans, and they would, they would come over and knock on the, on the window glass like they were in an aquarium and they wanted to see me move around, you know? <laughs> And so I went into a room in the back of the house and I closed those big shutters, you know, that make the room entirely dark. I had a little wobbly lamp and a notebook and a pen, and I wrote housekeeping. And it was such an amazing thing because it was like a sensory deprivation experience. It was one, actually. Um, but, you know, I was here, I, I hadn't been in, I, in Idaho for any length of time for probably 20 years when I wrote Housekeeping, and there I was in France. I would think I'm the only person in the universe who's in France writing about Idaho. But <laughs> <laughs> in any case, um, I would think, what blooms at what time? What does it smell like? In what part of the woods would it bloom, you know? in this darkness. And after I had done this a little while, I would have these memories that were almost as bright as dreams. 
you know? And I would find out that my mind had stored memory of a, uh, with a richness, a sort of saturation level memory that I would never have dreamed was there under other circumstances. And it's been true, I mean, I, that's been true repeatedly, though never in such an intense or surprising way. But it's also true that if you pose a, an aesthetic question to yourself, you know, I've worked to a certain place in a novel and I have no, way, no idea where to go. Take a nap, take a walk, take a vacation. Because, because you think that you've given up on the problem, your mind has not. That's one of the most uncanny experiences that people have. And when the, when the solution comes, it is elegant. It's much better than you would ever have just sort of contrived out of desperation. And one of the things that I really have to tell my students is do not force solutions. You know, if you have come to a stopping place, be grateful. Because when you solve this problem, when you let your mind solve it, it will be better than anything you would have intended. It, it, does that help um, account for, I mean, you have, I guess, uh, housekeeping and then 13 years later, Gilead, and I can imagine the pressure of being a Pulitzer finalist, and, you know, you're thinking, oh, so close, you know, and, and I don't know, maybe, I don't know, I'm, I'm nowhere near, uh, so I, I'm projecting myself onto you, but um, I would imagine the pressure of having to write something after that and just to see, you know, 13 years go by, and what, did you have that sense of pressure after your wrote housekeeping that, yeah, just what was going on in those 13 years? Was there a nagging sense, I have to write something now that there's a sense of expectation around your work? It was actually 24 years. Oh, 24, sorry, okay. Yeah, 2004. You make That's me sound right. downright prolific. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, when I was, I was interested in writing, of course, you know. And, and so I decided that I would look at the books that were coming out at that time. The thing, whatever, on the front page of the New York Times book review section that I would procure in my little village in France. And the, uh, I didn't like any of them. I mean, it wasn't, like, I could not imagine myself dealing in the terms that, that were dealt with, you know? And so my solution was to set my novel in, in Idaho, in my own home landscape, because nobody else had written fiction there, you know, about that place. It was mine, you know, and I could completely, the language that I could use and all the terms of the creation of it were mine, you know? Then, and that worked. Now the obvious problem, of course, is that you don't want to use a solution like that twice. You know, and so um, I was fiddling around with one thing and another, but it became clear to me that it was very hard for me to write anything that I actually believed was true if I was outside my that little environment that I had found. And I, you know, one of the things that I have always been horrified by is the thought that I would simply be someone who was passing a, a bad cliche you know, into language one more time, you know. So I had this idea that I had to know about the actual integrity of what I was writing. I had to know the world better. This is after my PhD, I need to hardly say. So, so what I did for the next 24 years essentially was read everything, you know, capital and the wealth of nations and the theory of population and everything, all those big constituent parts of what we take to be our description of the world, you know, Freud, you know, everything. And, uh, and classical economics from the late 17th century. <laughs> I don't, re it's a painful read, I don't encourage anyone. <laughs> In any case, uh, it was only when I, I ha you know, of course there's, there's always drastic limits to anything you know and you will always be wrong about much of what you say. But I really felt as if I had found myself to a terrain where I was in some command of my ideas and my language and then I could write fiction again. 
That, that sounds to me like an incredible amount of self-restraint. Um, just being able to think through, like, <laughs> wow, that's, yeah, that's a lot of reading. That's a big reading list. I mean, <laughs> to say that took, you know, two decades to get through, you know, your wish list of things that every person should read, or at least someone, uh, or you would feel at least um, like, I've done my, my due diligence here. Um, how do you, uh, yeah, I, I'm kind of trying to speak to the, the New York audience here of a lot of the inner voice in our, our minds of having to succeed or produce. How do you respond to that inner voice that you have? Frankly, I think I was born without it. <laughs> 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 I mean, if, if it had happened to be true that I never wrote another novel after housekeeping, I was content with that. I've always, you know, as I use the word hedonism advisedly, but I have always found ways to be absorbed in things that were of very great interest to me. And, uh, I, and I think maybe, again, this is a sort of Calvinist idea that the mind is a mystical experience, you know? And that, I mean, it's wonderful if it takes you into, you know, science. It's wonderful if it makes you active in some way like that. But it's also wonderful as experience simply if you never say a word. And it, the wonderfulness of it can be enhanced by the degree to which you enrich it with everything of quality that you can give it. Um, I think I was taught that as a, chi as a child. Um, I've always believed it. I just enjoy thinking about things. And if they eventuate in fiction, that's great. <laughs> Um, as you look at your work now in your, I put in quotes, retirement, because I know you're, you're working probably as much, if not more, now than you were in Iowa in your uh, writer's workshop, what, what does your world look like now as we think about um, you know, having a very different day-to-day you know, -day schedule? Oh, huh. when I'm home, I just basically, I mean, ideally, I just sit down in the corner of a comfortable couch and work all day. And then I eat something. <laughs> it's not thrills and chills, you know. <laughs> I'm resisting the temptation to ask you what you eat. I have a pretty strong vegetarian bias. Actually, my assistant does my shopping for me so that I will never have to get off the couch. <laughs> <laughs> so I basically eat what she brings me. Sometimes it's lots of kale. seems pretty um, how would you describe kind of the the biggest differences from being in a world where you're kind of seeing and building into students and the university academic life to uh, a time where now you're just kind of thinking through all the speaking engagements all the different writing assignments you have what's been the biggest uh, transition point for you oh well <clears throat> You know, one of the th I've had the most wonderful job in the world, which is teaching in the workshop, um, partly because the writers that I have worked with are so interesting, and partly because I could teach a seminar in any subject of my choosing. And I would, one time I did this text, this thing called problematic texts, and it was the biggest grab bag of things you could possibly imagine. But nobody, you know, they give you tremendous latitude, and I could, uh, you know, teaching Old Testament, New Testament, teaching Melville over and over again, American literature and so on. All of these things are simply things that I love. And uh, I didn't, <laughs> I mean, what a job, you know. I didn't, I didn't have to grade any papers or anything. I just did this, you know. <laughs> but, but the fact is that in order to teach the classes that I taught, I was continuously doing research because I don't like to do anything twice the same way. It's my housekeeping syndrome. Um, so I, you know, I, I got very practiced and very much in the habit of 
researching all the time, um, which I still do. It's very much part of what I do when I'm preparing lectures and so on. Mm -hmm. And can you tell us a little bit about what you're researching these days? What's been kind of the area that you feel really passionate about or excited about? Well, you know, I've gotten myself overextended where it's hard for me to, um, you know, follow my interests in the way that I, in an ideal world or another world or something like that, I would do. But I've gotten very interested in the 14th century in Europe. Um, if you read people that are sort of off the map in terms of the usual understanding of the period, there are all kinds of amazing ideas circulating about political democracy and, you know, the autonomy of cities and all the rest of it. People like Marsilius of Padua or, or um, Duns Scotus or all sorts of people uh, thinking in ways that it, it was my historical mistake to think of as arriving late in Western history, which in, when in fact, they, you know, they arrived promptly and, and, and then, of course, ran up against the resistance of, of uh, established power and so on. But it, it's, you know, it, it might seem like a sort of tri it's not a trifling thing, but I would, you know, you try to think what human beings are. And one of the things that, you know, that you're sort of encouraged to think is that they quietly lived under a feudalist order, you know, that there is something in human nature that would make them submissive for that long in that degree. And then you find out, no, no, there are all sorts of different ideas floating around, all sorts of books that, you know, that exist and get burned and are recreated and so on. Um, and it, it's kind of given me a different idea of human nature and the human project, whatever that is. Mm. Well, I think so much of, you know, our country, we're in a lot of flux right now. Um, a lot of fear kind of drives, I think, agendas. And as we are in a place where we're really questioning our national identity, um, are there two Americas here? Um, what is America? What is the identity of America? And I, I say this especially as someone who's written books that have deeply um, you know, touched a, a deep chord in people from a lot of different backgrounds, religious backgrounds. Uh, yeah, how would you answer that question? What is America? Well, <clears throat> you know, it's a work in progress. <laughs> um, I really, uh, you know, it seems to me that there are a set of absolutely essential ideas, you know, that we are created equal, that uh, we, we as creatures of God are invested with a degree of value that we can't even ourselves understand and that we, we discover in the fact of liberating each other further, we discover, discover in the fact of challenging ourselves more deeply, you know, so that there's this, it, you know, in, in, in an ideal America for me, there would be this continuous uh, uh, mutual liberation in the sense of the enhancement of, of all good possibility, you know, and then if we did that, I mean, if, we, if you think if we actually released the, the tension, the, the, released the tension, re, the, the capacities of, of people in general, it would be like, you know, splitting the atom or something, where this, the same energy that had held up something very tightly together would be, become a vastly expensive energy. Bad metaphor. Uh, <laughs> In any, but I mean it. I mean it. I'm just sorry of the consequences of splitting the atom. But <laughs> in any case, we don't know what we are. You know, as has been remarked in other settings. Um, but we know. You know, I, I teach people all the time. Have taught them, who have no, who have an impulse to write and no idea of what they would be as writers. What would come from them? You know. And I think that that's a very good model for most human experiences of life. And, and I would simply, you know, it's very Emersonian, really. It's not a modern idea, Tocquevillian, to, to do the best we can to find out what we are. Um, 
I think that that, you know, we don't have to have a restrictive notion of our identity beyond a sort of democratic piety around the assumed capacities of any other human being um, and ourselves, you know. Um, that, I mean, that's, a, that's idealistic or something. But the thing about it is that, that it doesn't make us try to find some self-definition at a past time beyond the idea of equality and the sacredness and capacity of human beings. We don't have to get into any sentimentality about once we did this and once we were that, you know? Because all the best would be still realized, still to be realized. Other countries don't do that. Other countries have, in a certain way, ethnic identities and so on. We should be very grateful that we don't have that. We have no carapace, you know. Um, we could do anything. And, and I think, frankly, that we're good enough people that the anything we did would be something we could be enormously thrilled by. In uh, your previous book, uh, collection of essays on uh, the givenness of things, you write on fear. And I think in, in this collection of essays, I think uh, you end with uh, this essay on slander and you know what happens when fear becomes our worldview and when the, the stories you hear in the news begins to really deepen your sense of all that can go wrong is going wrong. And uh, I hear uh, you as a important and powerful voice uh, speaking on the importance of optimism. Uh, and can you speak a little bit of how important is optimism in our day to day, especially when it feels like it, it, it's not, that optimism is not as grounded as we would like it to be? Well, we're, we are in a strange phase. There is no question about that. I mean, you know, Various circumstances have given us a very big problem to deal with. <laughs> the other side of this, and I'm certain there will be one, the other side of it is that people now are much more conscious of what they have, want, love, revere, much more inclined to articulate their expectations of themselves in terms of a sort of civic obligation to restore, to renew, you know, to find our way to, to uh, the order that prevailed that we never quite appreciated properly. Um, I mean, I think that people now in a day-to-day -day way know more and say more about, you know, American democracy than they have ever done before in my life, ever. And, and something profoundly good could come from that, you know. Um, when you think about the way that uh, power is used, uh, I mean, when you think about democracy, democracy is, at least in theory, supposed to be uh, from the ground up. Uh, but as we think about how power is used today, and our, especially with the pushback of, uh, you know, from the Me Too movement, all these kind of groundswell movements pushing back. You know, is this a real bright spot in our in our world today? In, in the ways that people are pushing back against the abuses of power, or how do you understand where we are with respect to, um, you know, power in general? Um, well, you know, I think that we. There are so many things happening simultaneously. I think that, um, you know, uh, improving gender relations in, toward, the, toward equality would, of course, be an excellent thing and very much, to, you know, very much to be desired. I think that there are perhaps issues that ought to loom a little larger at this point in time. Um, I think that we're entering into an economic situation where uh, we're going to be creating, by the evolutions of the economy, poverty on a scale that we have never seen. And, you know, a woman can have all the rights in the world, but if she can't make a living, she has no rights. 
you know? I mean, that, I think that to a certain extent, real issues are obscuring more daunting issues that, that are behind them, you know? Um, I, I read about like taxi drivers, you know, being, it's like reading about the old handloom weavers in, in Britain who just died in, in utter wretchedness because some machine came in that pushed them out of the way. Um, when we're destroying our social safety net at the same time that we're create, creating an economy that will cause more and more severe problems. And I think that we really ought to be looking at that. Yeah, as I think about your contribution to um, the larger world uh, and the issues we have, your, your voice, your words, I feel, is, that's your, your primary, uh, I don't want to use the word weapon, I, I'm a, it's your primary tool uh, of, of, of wielding that power and influence. And, um, you know, what I appreciate at the end, again, let me just read you, uh, we'll read to the audience, you don't need to hear your own words, but uh, for those of you who have yet to, to read this essay, um, this is the last essay, and I find this to be uh, the most poignant, uh, especially with the larger question of what are we, as, uh, as Christians, uh, really wrestling with how are we to navigate the complexities of our world today? Uh, what are we to do? And, and um, let me just read a, a portion, a sizable portion of this last essay. Uh, these, these days, people can be heard wondering how we have come to this place of rancor and division and how we can move beyond it. To effect change in a culture so vast and complex as this one seems imponderably difficult. But there are a, a good many Christians among us, even if only the faction who consider themselves an embattled minority can claim to qualify. They and all the rest of us who accept the authority of Scripture can find many passages that describe the Christian life, which is, as it says in Titus 3.2, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, and to show every courtesy to everyone. In Galatians, on the one hand, Paul says, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And on the other hand, in the first chapter of Romans, he lists the sins of the worst pagans. Among other things, they were filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, covetousness, malice. Full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, craftiness, they are gossip, slanderers, God-haters. The list is long. I quote from it to make the point that malicious speech ranks among the gravest transgressions. Let me just stop there. You go on uh, with more scripture, but um, can you speak to us about uh, the power of words and how uh, ideally, um, as, as people who submit ourselves to the scriptures, you know, how we are to use our words in our, uh, given our culture today? That's a real problem because, frankly, I think that, I mean, I think that we are in a place where we have to be very clear about what is objectionable, what we cannot tolerate in the culture, you know. Um, the, but I think Paul is, is clear about that. There are circumstances in which you absolutely must say, that doesn't look like Christianity to me, you know, that sort of thing, which is a, is a very sort of shocking thing for some people to hear. But um, I think that, you know, I've, I've been reading uh, writers on the Old Testament because I'm writing on the Old Testament. And I, I got uh, Bellhausen's book, um, Prolegomena to the History of Biblical Israel, or whatever it is, an incredibly influential book. It's the one that introduced this phenomenon of J, E, P, and D, you know. And uh, it was introduced as an important uh, theory into English by uh, an essay that he wrote for the Encyclopedia Britannica on Israel. And uh, the end of this essay on Israel is how, how, is, how are we to get rid of this culture? How is this irksome culture of Judaism to be suppressed or assimilated, you know? And I think that when you read that, you have to read back through Wellhausen and say, from what mentality is he interpreting, you know? He, he was a highly respected biblical scholar and critic. What was he telling people, you know? Um, that the we have a history in Western civilization 
of this tremendous antagonism bil building up from sermons, from tracts, from you know, th th interpretive theories, from anthropology, from linguistics. I mean, you you keep coming across this all the time, and it's like you know, what, under all sorts of pretexts, this thing arises again, and. It's in, you know, then, then people go crazy, you know? And it's, it's like this drip, drip, drip of an insidious idea, you know? And I think that, I mean, as Christian people, we ought to be able to look at things like that and say, that is language that, has, that carries the potential for extreme destructiveness, you know? We've seen, you know, you see the same thing in racial language in, in this culture and so on. How many times do people insist on a certain view of things before it begins to, to, to express itself on our, our practical lives, you know? I mean, you, you, read, you read human history and, and it is a, it's a scary thing, partly because people are so often the, you know, the right hand does not know what the left hand is doing, or vice versa. And that the, uh, but so much of the, you know, language is overwhelmingly potent in human society. It's basically the whole matrix and dark matter of human society. And words don't die, words don't perish. If you legitimize cruelty in someone else's hearing, you have infect the, infected them, in effect, you know. If you, if you pick up that kind of language from somebody else, you're like the little petri dish in which something bad is germinating, you know. And this is, I mean, people, you know, you can't put your hand on language. You can't, you know, quantify it or whatever. But you have to watch it. And you particularly have to watch the language that is coming out of your own heart, your own mind. Um, I mean, it really is scary when you read stuff that is, you know, late 19th century European, and you think you're just reading a book, and then suddenly, woof, up comes, you know, anti-Semitism. And you think, where did that come from? How did that, how was that arrived at, you know? And there it is. It's, you know, we, I mean, I don't, I, I have a very strong impulse to say, you know, that, uh, you know, Fox News is carrying out a war against Thanksgiving, you know. <laughs> it made us all very reluctant to sit down at a table together. But, <laughs> but at the same time, I think, is that fair? And then I think, yes. <laughs> There's nothing after that, okay. I uh, just wanted to make it sure. But uh, I think to your, to your also, um, I, I was going to say defense. You don't need a defense. Um, I would say some of the words that you use, uh, and I want to, this is kind of the last uh, question to you, but um, in your essay, Grace and Beauty, where you begin to describe grace, I think in terms of the, the potency of words, um, let me just share this, and I would love for you to elaborate further uh, just on uh, the nature of grace, especially um, given the picture that this, this particular quote begins to paint. Uh, theologically, grace must include the fact that we have untried capacities to live richly in a universe of unfathomable interest and that we can do and that we can and do amazingly enhance its interest with the things we make. Isn't it true that we actually add things to the universe, the great plenum, and this is true, I would say, by the grace of God. Can you elaborate? That's this really, you know, for me, the Center for Faith and Work, this really strikes at the core of, uh, of what we try to do as a ministry. And so I'd love to hear you just elaborate on what I just shared. Uh, well, you know, I'm so, I mean, human creatures are such an odd presence in a world that otherwise works pretty well, you know. Uh, <laughs> But we have these strange privileges. I mean, I have become very persuaded that the ca capacity for error, which we enjoy <laughs> endlessly, is. Uh, <laughs> but it's it's the strange it's the strange story of error and correction that is how 
human consciousness forms, you know? It's how we, in, any insight into anything of interest forms around, no, that isn't it, no, that isn't it, you know? Um, and there, so, I mean, there is that, which is not characteristic of creatures in general. Then there is also the fact that I can do something, people in this room can do something, that actually changes how life is, is, is experienced, which is just an absolutely extraordinary thing and, and an incredibly human thing, you know? There is no, no equivalent. Um, I think that, I mean, when I wrote The Givenness of Things, part of my point was that um, there's an arbitrary quality to the way that reality is put together. This is, I owe that concept to Jonathan Edwards, actually. But, but uh, you know, it's, when you think of the universe as great roar and flash and tumult, you know, and then here we are, you know, this little, little, little planet with a little bundle of atmosphere around it, you know, that makes everything that we do possible, without which anything we do is unthink, you know, would, would be unthinkable. And within this very arbitrary fact of the isolated earth and the conditions that allow us to be human on the earth, there is given to us also so arbitrarily the fact that we can add things into reality, you know? I mean, scientists say things like, Information cannot escape from the universe. I do not know what that means. <laughs> but I know that the meaning would be meaningless or whatever if there were not information creating consciousness in the universe, you know? And, and uh, I mean, even that, even that in itself is a sort of implication of the fact that we participate in being at a radical level that is utterly unique to us. You know, um, and <clears throat> it, this overplus, you know, I mean, it's interesting that like Darwinists and people, you know, of that mode, they're always trying to make reality into an, a little kind of Rubik's cube of mutually dependent, you know, segments, mutually perpetuating, mutually reinforcing. But that's not what it's like. What it's like is that, given the fact of a strangely and beautifully functioning ecosystem, we exist. Who are, if we're gonna take a cold look, the greatest threat to the ecosystem? No other need be imagined, you know? There's a, the, there's a drama with striking overtones of tragedy in the fact that we inhabit this very singular planet. Um, so, I mean, within it, we have to accept the terms of our existence, which are things like, we are incredibly active all the time, pity the busy monster, you know. We are in profoundly creative. We are profoundly co capable of groping our way toward an extraordinary degree of knowledge and understanding. Um, I mean, when you think, I mean, we're a speck. In the terms of the universe, we're nothing, you know. And we are the consciousness of the universe insofar as we can know. We actually know what happened four billion years ago or something. We have developed the means to know that. So that there's this tiny physical reality of Earth and this huge, unimaginably vast phenomenon of inquiry and comprehension that we we are the sole center of, you know? So anyway, I think that, I mean, the fact that we can, for example, create and that we can create things that are profoundly positive, that affect the way that people see things, you know, forever afterward and so on, that I think is simply part of how God made the world. That is grace. That's a dignity and a, a freedom that, uh, that God gave to human beings in a singular way, you know, I mean, not, there has no analogies. Um, so in other words, every best thing that anyone does, I think is a pure manifestation of the grace of God, you know, uh, and our capacities for doing wonderful things are untested by us.
but clearly enormous. Let me close with um, the words of Reverend Ames here. Uh, I'm writing this in part to tell you that if, if you ever wonder what you've done in your life, and everyone does wonder sooner or later, you have been God's grace to me, a miracle, something more than a miracle. You may not remember me very well at all, and it may seem to you to be no great thing to have been a good ch the good child of an old man in the shabby little town you will no doubt leave behind, if only I had the words to tell you. And Marilyn, I just want to say you have been uh, to God's grace to us in the way that you have brought together, um, you know, arguing against the deleterious effects of positivism to uh, the wonder of um, ordinary life and life lived in a very uh, unnoticeable fashion, but the beauty that's intrinsic to uh, that life lived in faithful service to God. Um, you have embodied it in ways that I think none of us really could have anticipated and for that reason I say you are a real grace to us so thank you for being with us today thank will you. you join me as we thank Marilyn Robinson